Can I swear on here? It's encouraged. You already did, actually. bro. <laughs> I, yeah, it's, uh, I think I swore before you recorded, though. Yeah, well, the thing is, when we had Richie Incognito on, he didn't swear at all. So, yeah, oh yeah, uh... I'm sure. Yeah, he's a <laughs> he's a good Christian man. He wouldn't do that. Never, never. Well, How man, it is good to see you, Tyler. How's your day been, man? I saw the, you and uh, talking a little. Uh, Bob McGinn, Aaron Rodgers. Of course, you wait until he's in a four day retreat to fucking release a article. I don't know what the hey, Packers don't want him. <laughs> I don't know when the hell he's going on these retreats. Am I supposed to time up my life to retreat? I didn't even know Bob was going to say that when we did that podcast this morning. It was I was uh, as floored as everybody else. Yeah, that's that's interesting. The timing of it's always great too, isn't it? Like I'm not saying it's on purpose, but. You know, the guy's freaking in a bunker for four days. Can't respond. <laughs> do you think that, a, do you think a message gets to him in the bunker? Do you think somebody gives him a heads up? Dude, I don't know, man. Like it, I, I'm trying to picture what he was, how he was describing it. Like, cause I've known people that have gone on like retreats before or like not even a retreat, but like a vacation that's like just, you know, no technology, like just remove yourself for a couple days. But like the buddies that done it that I know, like usually go on like a hunting trip or like a ski trip and it's just leave the phones, you know, no computer, none of that. Let's just kind of, you know, take yourself out of that world for a couple of days. And I've heard it has uh, had some benefits, but the way Aaron was describing it, I just picture like, you know, freaking like a prison just being in a black hole, you know what I mean? Like <laughs> something miserable. But yeah, like what do they call that? Like the uh like, like I don't know, where you get in trouble in prison and they like throw you in the dark cell for a week. <laughs> well we we just <laughs> watched like, uh, Matilda with there. Ella. It's like the chokey. Yeah. Yeah. It's like I can't remember what it's called, but he's like, oh it's got a little slot they put your food through. And I'm just picturing like I don't know, Shawshank Redemption or something and freaking Andy Dufresne getting put in the black room for a week. <laughs> I don't Man, know. I mean, I've heard it's had some benefit. I mean, shit, it'd probably be good for all of us to... I wish I could put my phone down for a couple of days and hit the reset button, man, especially with how everything's so easily accessible now. But that's part of our life, dude. It's hard to do that. It's hard to get away from it, you know? That's a great point. I agree. I mean... The, the idea of uh, unplugging from the world is refreshing and needed by all. I think we're all addicted to screens. But, I mean, when, when Jamal Williams was on this uh, last week, he's like, yeah, I did something like that, but it was like an hour long. You know, like four days. Yeah, is... yeah that doesn't really count. I mean, <laughs> what, was he taking a nap and set his phone down for an hour? <laughs> it was like meditation, and he visited like five different versions of himself, he said, over time. So, yeah. Did you guys cross I... paths? I can't remember. I don't think you did. No, no. I think Jamal, uh, I think his first year in Green Bay was 17. So that would have been my first year in Detroit. Um, and then, you know, he got, I think he just finished what his second year. I've been done for four. So we never played together, um, working, you know, doing the sideline for the Lions last couple of years, middle locker room. I talked to those guys. So I've gotten to know him over the last, uh, you know, two seasons. And I mean, there's not many like authentic guys like that. You know what I mean? Like he just is who he is, man. He's awesome. Like he's just a... He's just like, I just want to play football and leave me alone. You know, <laughs> like that's all he wants to do, man. And he's just, uh, he's a cool cat, man. I wish I could have played, played with him because he was, uh, he's just, he's one of those dudes that he's just got that infectious and contagious energy and attitude about him. That's just fucking awesome, man. He's just a great dude. I mean, you'd love that as a lineman. I mean, you want to back oh, yeah. fighting. I mean, when Eddie Lacy had his weight under control and he was, you know, running over four or five, six dudes at a time. I imagine that was a fun back to block for. Oh, God, yeah. Eddie was, I mean, those first couple of years was, what, 13 maybe, I think might have been his rookie year. Um, even 14. I mean, he's probably, he's the best back in my 10-year career that I blocked for, like, hands down. I mean, and he didn't have, you know, that, 
you watch guys now that man they get to the second third level and they take it 80 yards and they're gone you know like eddie he'd be lucky if he'd get to 40 you know like he was getting honked down he was getting chased he didn't have many <laughs> yeah i'm gonna that arizona run be, that arizona uh, run. and that was a screen too i think you Let's, know but yeah. i don't even think you know, like we knew that but he would uh he made a lot of bad shit go away for linemen i mean his vision um his understanding of like where the hole's supposed to be how to set up blocks he was by far the best back that i got to block for and it was awesome man because i know especially like those 2014 2015 packer years um shit our offensive line man we always thought of ourselves as you know being the top in the league with dallas at the time um, and we kind of joke now, like we talk, I talked to, you know, Balaga and sitting in those guys, Dave and Corey, we're like, man, can you imagine like how much better we would have been with like freaking Aaron Jones? Well, you know what I mean? Cause like, it, it, like <laughs> yeah. Jones, in my opinion is like one of the, he's still underrated in my opinion, but he's one of the funnest backs to watch, man. Cause he's so damn explosive. Um, the way he hits holes and he's not a big dude either. You know, but he hits with so much power and so much momentum that, you know, you give him the ball, like it's almost like a guaranteed five, six yards, you know, and he's got that explosiveness. It was a guy that I just look at now and I'm like, damn, I'm kind of jealous. I didn't get a chance to block for that dude because uh, he's a he's a freaking special cat, man. He's awesome to watch. I feel like you don't need an introduction because we got, you know, a lot of folks in here have watched you from from day one. But those who don't know, TJ Lang, Super Bowl champ. Two-time Pro Bowler, illustrious Packers career, Lions captain, and like I said, like a magnetic pull to your locker in there because you were gonna you were gonna be honest, you know. If you, and if you asked a dumb question, you'd give it you'd give it to us, which I appreciated as well. That was good. But I think the first time we talked was you would, you, you were battling Derek Sherrod, I want to say like they drafted him as a tackle. Yeah, in the first round, yeah. and they wanted to like kind of kick you in the ass and challenge you for the guard position because uh, you admitted, "Hey, man, I partied a little too much and wasn't taking things serious," and you kind of blew him away in training camp and didn't look back from there. Yeah, that was uh, that was 2011. Um, actually, 2010. You know, just to rewind, you know, Tauscher had just uh, I think officially retired after that. Um, well, he, he had gotten hurt. I'm sorry, Tauscher did. They brought him back kind of at the end of half of 09. Um, going into the offseason, you know, that was really the one spot on the offensive line was that right tackle spot. And my rookie year, I was kind of the sixth man. You know, I started, I think it was four or five games. I think, you know, three at left tackle, a couple at right tackle, filled in a little bit at guard. Um, so that second year, I was like, man, like this is my chance to go you know, try to lock down a starting spot at tackle. And then they drafted Brian Balaga. And I was like, sure. shit, man, like, <laughs> you know, first <laughs> round dude, like, and, and all through training camp, he was wondering what the right tackle spot. And I'm like, damn. So, all right, you know, I just got to keep grinding. But, you know, it's well documented, man. My first couple years were, um, you know, for me, I was always young, you know, graduating high school at 17, graduate, you know, coming into NFL at 21, First time, grew up very blue collar. I mean, my house, you know, was probably 800 square feet, you know, and I just, I got a little bit of money in my pocket. I'm like, you know, I want to go have some fun, man. I want to bring my boys into town. I want to go out on Thursday, Friday, and I kind of lived that life a little bit. And thank God it was in Green Bay because in Green Bay, you know, like <laughs> you, can't, you can't get into too much trouble there. Uh, if I was in a big city, I don't even know if I would have seen a third year in the NFL. Um, but so that whole first two years were, uh, you know, yeah, doing way too much, you know, partying, drinking, trying to live that lifestyle, something that I'd never, you know, done before. But I think it's very easy to kind of fall into that trap when you're a young kid with, uh, you know, with some money in your pocket for the first time. But everything changed for me in, in uh, you know, 2011 there. I mean, my uh, girlfriend at the time uh, had just gotten pregnant, like right around Super Bowl time uh, in February of 2011. Um, going into that year, you know, our starting line was pretty much intact except for that left guard spot there in college. Oops, sorry there. Let me, uh, mute that there in college had gone into a uh, free agency and I, I think he went to Arizona, uh, if I'm not mistaken. Sure. So I kind of looked at that and said, okay, we got an opening at the left guard. Like I'm going to need to, it's my third year now. Like I need to prove I'm a starter, you know, like I don't think I can make it in this league as a six man 
you know, bouncing around team. Like I need to show these guys that I'm a starter. I need to show, first of all, I need to show my teammates, you know, that I've, you know, cleaned up the, you know, off field stuff and, and not going out partying, you know, four nights a week, not doing all that shit. Uh, I need to show it to my teammates first because you can hide a lot of shit from your coaches, you know, when you go into the building. I mean, you can take a shower, you can put the visine in, you can brush your teeth, you could, you know, like you can hide all that, but your teammates can't fool those guys, you know, and that's something that we always talked about. You can't, your teammates know what you're doing, you know, your teammates know if you're dedicated, your teammates know if you're, uh, you know, locked in and putting in the extra work and they're watching what you're doing in the weight room and in the off season. So I had to prove to those guys that, you know, it was my time to be fully invested. And, you know, I knew it wasn't going to be handed to me, that starting guard spot. They obviously drafted Derek in the first round, uh, you know, mid, mid 20s, I want to say. Mm-hmm. Um, he came in and I remember the first day, you know, they put him at left guard with the starters. And I kind of right. took that as a slap to the face. I was like, you know what, man, what the fuck? Like, I'm my third year here. This kid just got here and he's running with the starters. But, you know, I kind of sat back and I'm like, you know what? Like, I, he ain't, nobody's beating me out. I don't give a shit who it is. I don't care if it's a 10 year vet. I don't care if it's a first round, you know, pit. I don't care. Like, I'm going to take this in stride and I'm going to freaking battle my ass off until they, I'm going to force them to make me a starter. Like, I'm just getting, that was my mindset going to that camp. I had so much to play for. You know, my, my wife, uh, my son was born in August that year, uh, you know, a couple weeks into training camp. It's like, I just had so much there were so much different motivations you know it's not just me anymore it's not just a 22 year old kid 23 year old kid just having fun like I got a family I got to protect I got a family I got to provide for I got a little boy what kind of example do I want to set for them and I went into that camp man and I was just on a mission you know I was on a mission and and Sherrod you know I thought had a pretty good camp but by like week three at training camp you know the third preseason game I, I was like come on like let just make a decision, you know, let's go. And it was pretty clear. And and I, I earned that spot and shit went on to start the next eight years in the league, man. But that was, uh, that was just the work ethic. And, um, you know, I love the competition. I did, man. I ate that shit up. I absolutely loved it. You know, me versus you like made the best win. You know, there's a lot of guys that, you know, face a little competition. They shrivel a little bit. You know, they want to be the dude. But the, it, it's it, it's good, man. And I love that. And I ate it up and I soaked it up. And it was, uh, it, it just develops that character of earn everything that's going to come your way. You know, you just have to have that type of mindset. And um, that first year was was probably one of the most special years, that 2011 year, because yeah. I think I proved not only to myself, but you know, my teammates and my coaches that like, I can be trusted. You know what I mean? I can be a guy that you can trust me. I'm going to go out there. I'm going to give it everything I got and uh, never look back. And, you know, there was one instance where Ted Thompson came up to me. I think this was my second year. So probably the 2010 season. And he caught me off guard. I don't even, we were kind of in the gym at Lambeau and I turned a corner and he was standing there and it was just me and him. And Ted was a man of very, very, very few words. I mean, the eight years I was there in Green Bay, he might have said maybe three complete sentences to me. And uh, <laughs> one of them, he he bitched at me, told me my haircut was awful. Um, I don't know why. He just he just walked by me and said, like, your haircut sucks. And then he walked away. And I was like, it's something I think about to this day. I'm like, what the fuck was that? You know, <laughs> but uh, th- this one, he kind of caught me and he was like, he just looked at me in the eye and he said, hey, can I trust you? And I was like, yeah, 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 yes, sir. You can trust me, you know, and that was it. And he turned around, he walked away. And I was like, oh, shit, you know, like, I got to go now. <laughs> like, I, I got to be a man of my word. <laughs> so uh, that, you know, that's something I'll never forget. Just that quick little conversation. And um, I knew I had to, you know, I had to make some changes. And, you know, I'm, I'm glad I did, man, because I might have been out of that. I might have been out of the league if I didn't earn that starting spot that year. Man. That that's incredible on Ted. I mean, when you don't say much at all, when you do say a few words, it's it's going to carry a lot of weight. And yeah. I can remember when we talked, like you were so open in the moment. Then I mean, we maybe that story was September or October. Or I remember uh, I gained a lot of respect for you because I think I, for that story, I think I talked to a bartender at Kittner's. Oh man, man, you did some deep digging back then. I remember you used to <laughs> oh talk to a guy uh, down on you know. 
Main Street. TJ used to drink. I'm like, God damn, this dude's really doing. You drugs. you remember that? Yeah, because he didn't he say at the end of the shift they pour everything into a pitcher and then you just yeah, took like it all and- like the leftover stuff and like the last couple of us there was kind of like a challenge. Like, all right, come on, we got to chug it now. I I had to I had to go to bars and like tip the waiters waiters and the bartenders like don't talk to reporters about my lifestyle please. <laughs> did you really? <laughs> That's the t- I did that. I don't remember who it was, but I remember one time I went into one of those bars. And I'm like, who the fuck's talking to reporters about me drinking? <laughs> it's bullshit, man. <laughs> no, I don't that was me. Against you, Ty. You know that, but no, that's that that's what I'm I saying. I, I respected you because. Like, like, this guy's doing you were like, like that's all you said. I'll never forget. You're like, man, you really dug deep there. You didn't say, uh, hey, let me get you a headlock and uppercut you in the, in the chin <laughs> for revealing my, my party and ways. But yeah. you turned it around, and, I mean, then you were just a, a core leader on the team for that point forward. I mean, really, you didn't look back. It probably took me a couple of years until I was um, probably considered myself to be like a core guy, you know? Um, 2011, my first year starting was a pretty good year, left tackle. I'm sorry, left guard. Uh, 2012 was up and down for sure. I think that was the year we signed Jeff Saturday, and I was still playing left guard. I blew my elbow out like week four. Um, the rest of that season was kind of up and down, you know, just production wise. I mean, I had some injuries I was playing through, and at the end of that year, you know, going in the off season into 2013, um, we didn't really have an answer at left tackle. You know, if you remember that, like Balaga was the right tackle, Sitton was the right guard. You know, I was the left guard. I think Marshall Newhouse and Derek kind of filled in there at left tackle. Uh, going into that 2013 year, I think their plan was to move Balaga to left tackle. Um, sure. But they flip flop Sitton and I. They were like, Brian played next to Josh for a couple of years. They got that chemistry. So we're just going to flip them, you know, to the left side and flip you guys to the right side. But I also kind of took that like a little bit more as like a challenge, you know, like, man, like I think they're going to make me want to compete again, you know, to play on the right side. It took Josh and I shit months before we felt comfortable uh, flipping sides. But Brian, I felt so bad, man. Brian actually, you know, his uh, that year they moved him to left tackle. Uh, he he blew his ACL out in the family night scrimmage. That's right. And yeah, and that was, and he didn't even know. Like he went on to play like another twenty snaps, and you know, get get the news. Obviously, his players a couple days later after the scans and shit, and it was just like, oh my god, you know. Um, the year after that, twenty fourteen, I think was the first year for me where I felt like, okay, like I'm one of the you know top I don't know four or five guys on offense that. I feel like I finally earned my respect. I feel like I finally earned like that leadership role kind of building into that, you know, with sitting and I and obviously Aaron, you know, Jordy Nelson, Coon, those guys type of guys felt like we were kind of that core on offense that, you know, you set the standard, you, know, you show the guys what it takes, like what the expectations are. And that was probably the first year where I felt um, like, man, all right, like I, I don't I don't feel like I need to compete, you know, to to be a starter. I feel like I'm walking in day one as the guy and it's my job to, to bring everybody else up to that level, you know. And uh playing with those dudes, man. I mean, like I was so damn lucky coming into Green Bay, you know, just with the the expectation, first of all. Um, you know, the history of the offensive line. I mean, everybody remembers that, you know, mid 2000 offensive line with Marco and, you know, whale Flanagan, um, you know, Frankie, it's like, everybody remembers those guys. And that was kind of the, yeah, Chad. I mean, and Chad was, I think maybe in his ninth year, 10th year when I was a rookie, but you understood that coming in the room. Like this is a, we got a freaking standard here. We got an expectation. Like you got to look at those guys on the wall. Like that's what we expect out of you. Um, we came up even coming in, you know, Scott Wills was a vet, you know, Tosh was a vet, um, you know, Cliffy was a vet. And as a young player, you always hear these stories, you know, oh, the, don't ask the vets for shit. They're not going to help you. They don't want you taking their job. They don't want you, you know, competing with them and all that. Like I had a totally opposite experience. Like those guys were, 
you know, you, I leaned on him, you know, as a young player, you know, asking questions and, you know, how do you do this? How do we do that? What's good for the, you know, and those guys were awesome, man. And they kind of just uh, paved the way for what I still think, you know, even talking to Dave, who's still up there in Green Bay, you know, I still think that does, you know, that, that kind of, uh, you know, standard that's been set in that offensive line room there still resonates. And that wasn't from me or Josh or, you know, any of those guys, it was from, guys that played 10, 15 years before us. And I think it's uh, something that awesome, something that we tried to pass down to all the young guys that came to that room, even by the time we were vets, you know? So it's funny now, you know, going through that point where, you know, coming in, God, I remember looking at Cliffy. I might've been a rookie and Cliffy at the time was, you know, God, I don't know. He probably made 50 million bucks, you know, just signed a new two-year deal, paid him a ton of money and, I think I looked at him. He was in his 10th or 11th year, and I was young. And I, I never forget this, man. And I looked at him, and I was like, man, Chad, like, I wish I was in your shoes. You know, like, I wish I was freaking 10-year vet, making all this money. And and I'll never forget. He looked right at me, and he goes, I'm telling you, man, I would trade everything I got to be in your shoes. And that still resonates with me because even as by the time I got to my ninth and 10th year, all the young guys – you know, whether it was Green Bay or when I got to Detroit, they were all sneaking in my locker, like looking at my paychecks, being like, oh, man, fuck, like I wish I was you, dude. And I, it was like, it hit me. And I looked at him, I'm like, God, I would give all that shit up to be back in your shoes, to be able to redo that, to, to be able to start again as a 22-year-old kid and do this whole thing over again, man. You know, and that was, uh, that was just like, so like kind of emotional and special for me because, I didn't understand it when Cliffy said it to me, you know, yeah. that he wished he was a rookie. He wished he was a young cat again. By the time I got an old cat, I was like, fuck, man, like, I wish I could do that all again. You know, I'd give up all that money. I'd give up all that shit just to just to go do that again, man. And Chad was right, dude, that he was right, man. That's that's how I think probably all veterans feel, you know, by the time you hang them up, you'd give it all up just to be a 21-year-old kid chasing the, chasing the dream and to do it all over again. And that's what's special about football. I mean, it's uh, I can't imagine being a professional athlete. It's hard enough for hard enough for us uh, high school players to let go, you know. And we're, now we're we're just a bunch of Uncle Ricos. Uh, but yeah. I, I got a million <laughs> questions for you. But I know there's Packer fans in here, so if anybody has some for TJ, just uh, sorry, fire sorry away. I got my Packer stuff behind me, man. There we go. Oh yeah, we I'm got sorry, we, there I'm might be a Lion shirt. fan in here. That's what I worked yeah. out in today. I haven't showered yet, but representing both of them. <laughs> What's up, fellas? I see Jeff has his hand up. Yep. Hey, uh, TJ, a couple of things. First of all, I want to just start off by thanking you. Just it was a privilege to watch you play in every way. And in, in, in watching the arc of your career, like the way you kind of laid it out from, you know, uh, getting drafted to kind of, for lack of a better word, figuring out, okay, this is what I need to do to be a pro. And I want to ask you a question about that, but I will tell you one of my strongest memories of your career, and this is probably a tough memory for you, was in the 2016 championship game against the Falcons. I think it was like the third or fourth quarter, and I think you I think you hurt your ankle or something, and you, and you had to come out. Yeah. And, and I just watched you walk to the sidelines – and I was just in awe because your le- your disappointment and your level of commitment as a pro, I was like, that guy is a team player. He is a warrior. I mean, I was just literally, it was like the highlight of that game to me. Unfortunately, it was an injury for you, but watching how much you cared and when you knew you couldn't play anymore, it really upset you. And you wanted to be out there till the end of that game, regardless of how things were going. And I just thought that just spoke so much volume about you as a player and as a person. And I don't know if you remember that moment the way I do, but I just, I was like, I knew it was hard for you. It was hard for you to walk off. It was hard for you to walk off. And I just thought, man, this guy, what we were lucky. We were lucky to be able to watch him for all these years. And I still remember it vividly. And I, I just want to thank you for that. That was incredible. But I do have a question. You talked about, you know, what What do you think was the turning point for you when you said, okay, I can't, uh, it's not, I gotta, I can't just go out and have a good time anymore? Was it one thing, was it becoming a dad? Was it 
you know, what, what, you know, what was it? What was the, what, was there a sentinel event that really kind of said, you know, made you think, you know what, I got to approach this differently if I want to reach my potential. Yeah. I'll tell you the one thing that sticks out, um, Jeff, and thanks for bringing up the great memories, man. First of all, I was lucky to play there for so long, but, um, I so we always had like a group. You got a group of your buddies that go out, you hang out, you party, you know, after the games. We were off Tuesday, so Monday nights were a good night to go out. Um, Josh Sitton and I, you know, still best friends to this day. Like for a lot of those years, or for you know, the first couple of years, like I felt like we were kind of running mates, you know, like if I'm going out and getting drunk, like he's next to me. But then I started noticing like I started doing it a lot more, you know, than other guys were. Um, and one conversation that we had was, you know, Josh came up to me, I think it was right before that, you know, 2011 season, I think maybe that off season heading up into that year. And we had a, he just, we had a real conversation, man. He kind of sat me down. He was like, dude, like we, we need you. Like we freaking need you, man. Like we got an opening left guard, uh, you know, and you know, whatever you're doing off the field, like tighten it up a little bit, you, you know, and that, that hit so much harder for me coming from him than it probably would have coming from any coach or, you know, anybody else in the organization, because that's like, that's my boy. That's my, you know, best friend. That's a guy who, you know, he was alongside me a lot of those nights, but that just opened up my eyes. I think that was the first conversation that really opened me up. Like, damn, like maybe I am kind of going down the wrong path. You know, if, if I'm thinking he's doing the same thing, but he's really not, he's letting me know, you know, you know, we need you, man. Like this is a big year. And I, I think that was the first point where I fully understood like, okay, I got, you know, my teammates coming up to me, like pleading with me to like get serious about it, put in the work and, you know, we need you on this team. Um, because honestly, my first couple of years, I kind of felt not really useless, but like that Super Bowl year. I mean, I had, I gotta be honest with you guys. Like I, I had a hard time even looking at my Super Bowl ring for a long time after that um, because I didn't feel like I did much to contribute to that. You know what I mean? It felt like it was, oh, Aaron Rodgers won me a Super Bowl ring or these guys, you know, won me a Super Bowl ring. And I, I took that really personal. I'm like, I want to get another – I want to get a ring where I feel like I deserve it, you know? And after all these years, now, I mean, shit, that was 12 years ago. I look back and I say – I did a lot to help that team, whether it was practicing, whether it was preparation, whether it was, you know, playing shit. I think I played, you know, a quarter and a half, if not two quarters in the NFC championship game against the Bears when Chad Clifton got hurt. You know, and I just had to remind myself, like, you're part of that team, man. You won a championship. But uh, that conversation with Josh and a couple of my teammates was like, OK, like I, I get it. You know, like that light switch went off and I get it. And uh you combine that with the fact, yeah, that I was also getting ready to become a dad. Um, and it just, everything happened so fast. I just remember, you know, everything happened so fast. We were just coming off a Super Bowl win. Uh, we were just coming off of the lockout, which we didn't even get to see each other, you know, until training camp again uh, in the 2011 season, right? We didn't have OTAs. We didn't have mini camps. We were in a lockout. So we didn't get to see each other. And in, during that lockout, I mean, I had some hard conversations with myself. Like, what do you, what do you want to do? Is this, because I, I realized if I don't win this spot right now, they're going to replace me with a younger dude who can do the same thing. That can be a six or seventh offensive lineman. And um, I made a decision, man. I guess that's the easiest way to sum it up. I'm glad you brought up the, <laughs> God, that NFC Championship game in 2016, what a fuck. God, I felt like we were down 21 nothing just getting off the bus uh, that day. Um, <laughs> shit did not go our way. But I had uh, – it sucks that that's my last memory, you know, playing in Green Bay. And when I – I think it was maybe week nine or week ten that year, I broke my foot against the Titans. Yeah. And I was getting ready to be a free agent. Um you know, kind of had a feeling that the team, I, I don't, I didn't really know what they were going to do. They talked to us in training camp. Uh, they said, you know, we get, we're, we want to take care of Dave. He's a young left tackle. We kind of want to lock him up. You know, we'll talk in after the season. But as a player, you kind of see the writing on the wall sometimes. Um, I broke my foot week 10. You know, I think the doctors told me it was going to be, you know, roughly seven to eight week recovery. 
doing the simple math, you know, that meant I wasn't going to play again that year. Um, and, you know, my career in Green Bay could have been over. Uh, and I'm not trying to toot my own horn here, but I I probably one one of the biggest times I've gotten in trouble with Green Bay was because I basically told them I'm not missing the fucking rest of the season. Right. I think I missed three <laughs> games and I started running on the treadmill probably after two weeks and the doctors were all screaming at me and they're getting pissed. And I'm walking in there and I'm like, guys, like I, I just, I got to find a way, you know, and I missed three games and I came back and I put a cast over it and I did everything I could to just go out there and be a part of that team. Um, because that's not how I wanted my story to end. Uh, fast forward to that NFC championship game. You know, I knew right away. I don't know what happened. I think I collided with Corey Lindsay, who was a center, playing it a weird way, and I felt my foot break again. Like I just felt the bone like snap, Oops. and uh, it went down. And you know, I started crying. And as they kicked me out the field, I got a towel over my head because I was like close to bawling my eyes out. And I wasn't crying because of the pain. You know, I was crying because of what it meant. I was crying because. Yep. You know, I think that was, that was the last time I was going to put on a Green Bay helmet. Yeah. And the emotion yeah. just hit me so damn hard yeah. at one moment. And it was just like, man, it was overwhelming, you know. And you're right, man. I didn't want to leave that field. We were getting our ass beat at that time. But I didn't want to leave that field. I, I know you did. That thing out, man. And that's just oh, so hard that that was my last play as a Packers. Because yeah. <laughs> obviously we wanted to end way different. But that was the emotion that I showed. Um, mm -hmm. And even, God, I remember watching it. I had so many texts after the game because at the time it happened, uh, Troy Aikman, I think, was doing the game with Joe Buck, and he made a comment that was like, oh, I played with a guy who, you know, blew his ACL and his PCL and blew his whole knee out, and that was the same reaction. So people were calling me like, dude, is your fucking knee okay? Like all this. <laughs> I'm like, yeah. I was laughing. I'm like, yeah, my, I broke my foot again. I'll be fine. But, you know, it's funny because so – uh, I think Troy said that. My goodness, I, it was a. It was a pretty so crazy. I know other. I know other people want to talk. I just want to thank you again. And your explanation about Josh was incredible because what it brings home is the point is you know when you get feedback from somebody like that, you know it's coming because they care about you, not that they're being critical of you. And that For sure. that really yeah, and that that makes all the difference in the world, doesn't it? I mean, oh, that no really. Doubt. Yeah. Yeah. And, and I was pissed at Ted for not resigning you because all I could think about is when you were walking off that field, we're never going to, these are not players. You don't see players like this very often. So thank you very much for everything. It was just <laughs> an honor to watch you play. I'm not kidding you. It was an honor to watch you play. I appreciate that, Jeff. And just from my part, like I was obviously, uh, I was disappointed that I didn't get to finish my career there, but uh, there's no hard feelings. There never has been, to be honest with you. I mean, I understood. Yeah. Every single year, you know, it's a business. People move around, and it yeah. sucks. It's hard. It's never easy. But I was uh, truly lucky and blessed to be able to call Green Bay home for for eight years, man. I grew up there. You know, came in a twenty one year old kid and left at a twenty nine year old man. Man, it's a uh, it was a special place, and it'll always be a special place for me. Thank you very much. I appreciate it, Jeff. Playoff captain of that last team, too, if memory serves. I think you were yeah. a captain of the offense. You see the with, picture with that up there? Too, Is that so. what you saw? You might see the glare, but. Uh, I just really cool. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah playoff, I remember you doing press conferences all week with that. Um, so, first and foremost, I want to echo Jeff's sentiments. It was it was, uh, it was was a lot of fun to watch you and sitting in that group kind of all the way together. I, I contend the – I've been watching the Packers for about 30 years, and that 2014 group you had – that's the best offensive line I've ever seen uh, come through Green Bay. And that's with all due respect to that group you mentioned with with Wall and Flanagan and <clears throat> all of those guys. Um, you know, you mentioned that, you know, you had trouble looking at your Super Bowl ring and stuff like that. But during the game, I don't know if you even know this, but um, Tremont Williams breaks up the last pass in the Super Bowl. And the first thing they show is you with your haircut that Ted Thompson had. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, Donald Driver yeah, just like – full-fledged uh, embrace with those two guys. And the emotion just kind of pours out. Just what was, what was that realization like? Because you were the young guy yeah. and driver, you know, you guys, at least from the outside looking in, it looked like really embraced the idea of winning a championship for him and uh, uh, Charles Woodson that particular year because those were the vets that didn't have 
yeah. titles. But what what was that moment like for um, obviously becoming a champion, but also being around the guy that you know you guys kind of dedicated it to to some degree? Yeah, it was. Uh, I'll tell you what, halftime was emotional because Woodson uh, broke his collarbone there in the first half. Um, you know, just remember being in the locker room there at halftime and it was, it was so quiet. Like you almost hear a pin drop, right? Like people were kind of worried because, you know, shit, we just lost Charles Woodson. I mean, he's not playing again. Um, I can't remember the exact situation, but he came in the locker room. He was in the office, you know, getting x-rays and all that. And he came back in wearing like a t-shirt and it was just like a, like, Oh shit. Like, you know, <laughs> and, uh, he gave us passionate speech. God, I wish I could remember word for word. I can't. But after that, it was very emotional. Going back on the field, second half, obviously, you know, guys did their thing. Um, late in that game, I remember, you know, I was standing on the bench and kind of waving the towel. You know, I was a young kid trying to get the crowd going, and and drivers stood up next to me. And Don, I think Donald, I think Donald got hurt in the Super Bowl too. Yeah, he like was wearing a boot. His foot. Yeah, he, wearing a boot. he got hurt too. And I remember like there was a point late in that game and I looked at him and God, I don't know at that point, he must have been in what is 12, 13, 14th year, you know? And he was like, he was crying and I could see the tears in his eyes. And I could just tell how much it meant to him. You know what I mean? As a young player, it was only my second year. You know, I didn't know Donald at the time that great. I mean, we had talked a bunch of times, but, you know, um, I just remember looking at him and something hit me like, dude, this guy's been in the league that fucking long. And you could just tell how much that meant to him. And <clears throat> after that last play, God, I just remember turning to him and giving him like the big, biggest freaking bear hug that I've probably given to anybody. And that was just like teammate to teammate. You know what I mean? It wasn't, you know, we weren't best friends, but it was just teammate to teammate. And there was something about it being a young player that uh, it it was hard not to get emotional about, you know, a guy that's worked, spent freaking over a, a decade trying to do that. And um, it was special, man. I get to, God, it's funny now, even especially this time of year when they're always replaying old Super Bowls and stuff and people send me pictures of, you know, oh, I didn't realize you dumped the, you know, I was also part of dumping the Gatorade on McCarthy. I don't know how I got into that. I saw Ryan Pickett try to do it by himself, and I happened to be standing there, and I grabbed the other side, and I did it. Uh, I mean, me as a second-year player, like, I probably didn't deserve to have that spotlight <laughs> to be one of those players that did it. It probably should have come from a veteran, but I was just the right place, right time. I got some great pictures out of it that were awesome. Um but I just remember something about Driver, man. I just looked at it, and I could tell just in his eyes, man, how emotional he was uh, and how much it meant to him, you know. And I was so glad that, you know, the team was able to do it for guys like him and guys like Woodson and guys like Chad Clifton that had put in so much freaking time and effort to do that. And I never really understood it fully until I became an older player um, because I think is a lot – like I was a second-year player when we won the Super Bowl, right? So my mindset was like, I'm 50%. Like, this shit ain't that hard, <laughs> right? It ain't that hard to win a Super Bowl. We did it in my second year, you know? So you kind of expect at that point that you're going to get back and get back and get back and win a couple I think more. everybody did. Uh, everybody but, did. Yeah, but yeah, by we the did. time Just, you get we did. to your eighth, ninth, tenth year, you realize how freaking hard it is and um, how close you can get, but how hard it is to get over that final hurdle. And that's when I fully understood what Donald Driver was feeling. You know what I mean? That's when I understood uh, the the pain, you know, and, and the veterans where it's no longer – you don't play about the money anymore. You play for that chance to go play in the Super Bowl, and you play for that chance to win. And I think when it all came full circle, you know, you look back and you're like, man, like I feel that pain or I feel that emotion that Donald Driver felt on that day. And I just happened to be the one standing next to him, you know. And I've always – Always, I don't know if it's my Irish heritage or what it is, but I've always been a very emotional guy. You know, I wear my emotions on my sleeves, man. Like I was, I'm Nick Sirianni every game, you know, during the national anthem where like I was crying, like you just get emotional, man. And it's hard to, it's hard to hide that sometimes, but, um, you know, man, that was just a, that was just an epic moment. That was just awesome being able to celebrate that. And uh, my God, like, 
I hate to be a downer. So still to this day, I'm so freaking pissed that we never got back. Like especially that 2014 year. I mean, that's oh, that that's the like, team. That's the oh, team, man. Like everything was cooking on our page. Everything was going right. It was just like, man, we got what Seattle two minutes, two minutes until we're in the Super Bowl, you know, and then shit just obviously went sideways. But that's the one team I look back at, and I'm just like, man, that because that team was the best team. I think that Green Bay's had in the last 25 years. That team was yeah. better than our 2010 year where we won the Super Bowl. Um, that's one that I've got to tell you to this day, I still can't even watch that freaking replay of that game just because it, it just eats at you, man. Like it just does. And that's one of the biggest regrets that I think a lot of us from that team are going to have for a long, long time, man. It's just tough. To, it's a tough pill to swallow. You know, and like I, mean, I said, when you're a second year player, you're a rookie. You don't think it's that hard to get to the Super Bowl when you do it. Well, when it's all said and done, ten years later, you're like, "Fuck, man!" Like that shit's hard to do. You know, that's what I made. I can remember thinking seven. Seattle was going to kick your ass, TJ. I was out there covering we the Seahawks thought, all week. Shit, man, they, we didn't know going to that game. They beat our ass. I think it was Week One that year, right? Yeah, we went to Seattle. I think. It was I mean, the Legion of Boom's at its peak. They beat our ass, and yeah. nobody won there in that time. Like they had won like eight hundred games in a row, or something. The only team that beat them was like a crappy Arizona oh, team yeah, in that won. area. They won like a million games in a row at home. Yeah, that place was. Uh, now you guys were wild. undefeated at home that year too. If that game, are you guys like the '90s Packers against the Cowboys that think if that game was at Lambeau, you would have won? See, I don't know, man. I <laughs> okay. I know Aaron used to talk about it. We used to talk about it a lot because, shit, we played in, what, three NFC championship games. All of them were on the road. Um, and we used to talk like, man, we just got to get one of these freaking games at home, you know. And then finally when I left and I went to, you know, retired, uh, it's like, shit, Aaron Rodgers had a chance against Tampa, you know, an NFC championship game at home, you know, like. They've had the number one scene. It's like shit, man. It's so frustrating. But I don't, I don't think if we would have had them at home, I don't know. I mean, shit. I, it it didn't really matter. I think it just was. The game we was up, just crazy. We were up sixteen insane. nothing for a long time in that game. Um, they obviously pulled the fake field goal. It might have been late in the third quarter, but even after that, we we're like, oh, okay, they like that's cute. Like fuck them. Let's go. You know, score. Let's bury this game. And. Uh, God, I just – and I you never blame teammates, but just we just had a couple crucial plays go against us. You know, the onside kick being the first one, we recover that. You know, everybody does their job. We're probably getting a first down, taking the knee, going to Super Bowl, right? Even if we stop, you know, after they scored that ensuing drive, you know, Russell Wilson threw up a fucking moon ball, and I think HaHa just mistimed his jump just by a half a second – and it just kind of went right over his finger. Even if they don't get that, maybe we got a chance with a minute left to go kick a field goal and go to Super Bowl. So it was just like a combination of 58 minutes. We felt like we were doing really awesome. And I know we weren't beating our ass on the scoreboard, but it felt like one of those games that was like, yeah, we're – come on, let's just finish this thing out, you know. And that's just – that's part of how hard it is, man, to to make those plays in that game because so, one thing so goes t- wrong and it's fucked. I mean, there was that moment too. I God, we could talk about that game for a full hour. I don't, I don't know what your va- your we advantage. Don't have, we really don't have to. I mean, Julie is telling Morgan to go down on the pick. I mean, oh, yeah, man. yeah, just yeah. I mean, there was just, and even you know me, like I remember there was a play in the first quarter. We ran like a power to the left, and you know, like Seattle's defense was always really hard to. ID because you don't know who the linebackers are like Cam Chancellor do you treat him like a safety do you treat him like a linebacker you're on the road there you can't hear each other and I remember there was a play where I pulled around in the first quarter and might have been like a you know second and eight or something and I was looking at the linebacker and Chancellor blew right by me and you know got a tackle where it could have if I just blocked him it could have been like a 20 yard yeah like I think about that shit all the time like I don't blame Bostic. I don't blame, you know, ha ha. I don't blame more. I don't, we all freaking have plays from that game where it's like, dude, if I would have just fucking hit him, I, I, Lacey might have scored on that play. You know, he might have been a fucking 24 to nothing, you know? So it's, it was one of those games that just, I think everybody probably had one play that was like, 
shit, man. Even early in the game, I think it was, you know, we thought we drew, we thought we drew Bennett off sides or maybe it was Cliff Averill. You did. Um, for a free Just, play and Aaron threw it did. up and it being an interception. We're all sitting there looking like, oh, it's off sides, right? Like, no flags like holy shit what the hell you know it was just everybody had to play from that game that was just like man if i would have done that a little different maybe it could have maybe we could have won that game and we had played the patriots earlier that year too at lambo and i think we all came out of that game like dude they all the patriots and like the dynasty like we can beat their ass man you know like we can and that was probably the most disappointing part now i know you probably don't want to play bill belichick twice in the season but we felt like, man, if we won that, if we would have won that game, shit, there would have been nothing that stopped us. But that's the, that's going to be the one game that'll probably haunt me the rest of my life. Did you have a, I have I mean, a question about that game, if you don't mind me asking. Uh, not to belabor the topic. Um, so it, I, what I remember from that game is I remember Mike McCarthy getting a little conservative down by the goal line, kicking a lot of field goals. And I'm just kind of wondering, like, what's your mindset as a player when it's, you know, fourth and goal or fourth and short down there? Are you thinking, why aren't we going for six? And the reason I ask is because as a Bills fan in the, in the 2020 AFC championship game, Sean McDermott got like that down by the goal line, like four times. It was just fourth and wimpy for the whole game. And it drove me crazy. Yeah, I I guess Mike, like I've never been uh I've never really, really been a player that had like liked questioning play calls or like questioning strategies. I was always just like call the plays, I'll fucking block, like I'll do my job, you know. Um yeah. I do remember I'm trying to remember specifics from that game. Like, didn't we get stuffed early on a goal line play? Um yeah, Kuhn, Kuhn got yeah, I think, stopped short. I think Kuhn got stuffed on like a fullback dive. Um yep. and we kicked his a elbow hit field, the ground. Yeah, we kicked a couple of field goals from what like inside, inside the, the five. yard line, maybe. Yeah, yeah. Um I don't know if that was just one of those games that, you know, they thought might be low scoring and you know, points are gonna be at a premium. I don't know. Um, obviously hindsight, you look back and you're like, shit, man, why didn't we go for that? Or why didn't we do that? Why didn't we do that? But in the, in the moment though, as a player, you're just like, yeah, well, whatever, man, like call the play, let's go, let's do it. You know? And if we get stopped, Hey, we get stopped. But I, I tell you, I, honestly, I think there was only one moment I had in green Bay where I was like very adamant about something we should do and we didn't do it, but that was, uh, 2015 when we went to Arizona and when Aaron Rodgers connected with Jance or uh, <laughs> Jeff, uh, you wanted Anderson, to go for two. We all, we were all you sitting there to... like fucking go for two, man. Like let's end this thing right now. Win or loss. We just basically hit the fucking lottery. <laughs> like getting a, a credit, you know, that hail Mary play was stupid. Uh, we had been to Arizona before, you know, my rookie year in 09 went to overtime and didn't work out. You know, I think it was a sack fumble touchdown, you know, the third play overtime. So it was one of those where, like, we were so beat, beat, man. Just like, let's end this game with one play. Give us one play. We didn't. We kicked the extra point. Obviously, I think Larry took a eighty-yard pass down to the three-yard line, like two plays into overtime, and <laughs> we lost. But as a player, I always tried to understand my role, which was just you don't call plays, you don't do this. Your job is to block. Your job is to execute what's called, and yeah. that was always kind of my mindset. Cool. Thanks for indulging that. <laughs> I think most players are like that, to be honest with you, too. Yeah. You know, um, just give me a play. Let's go. I heard that the Bills should move on from Sean McDermott. I'm not sure about anybody else. That was my <laughs> takeaway from that. No. I don't know. I mean, <laughs> hey, Jesse, I'm sorry. I just saw your hand up. Hey, Ty. Hey, uh, TJ. What's quick, up, just want to jump on here really quick, and, and there's a lot of stuff about Packers. I'm a huge Packers fan. Loved you with the team. Um, we're on draft season now, as I told Ty. We're on the dra draft season. Um, can you tell me a little bit about um, at Eastern Michigan when you kind of thought you had a chance to go pro and that process and uh, everything leading up to the draft, like what you can remember, just – Throw me some stories. Yeah, so it was probably um, 
God, it was probably maybe halfway through my senior year, to be honest with you, where I started to hear that maybe there was a little bit of buzz. Um, you know, and I had played against a bunch of, you know, great players. Uh, I played the Eastern, so not a ton from the Mac. But, like, we played Michigan every other year. We played Michigan State twice. We played some other big schools. And, you know, I was going against defensive linemen that were, hey, this guy's a second, third-round pick, and I'd play against and be like, I kind of beat their ass a little bit, you know. Um, they had a kid from Northern Illinois, Larry English, who was a first round pick. Uh, my same year I came out. And every time we played, I got the better of them. And I was like, man, like not hearing a lot, you know, NFL buzz, whatnot. But I might have might have been maybe halfway through my senior year where my offensive line coach, uh, Chris Symington, um, played at Colorado under Bill McCartney. So Bill McCartney's son was Mike McCartney, who's still an agent to this day. Um, and they were good friends. And he kind of told me the year before, sorry, I regressed. Year before we had a defensive tackle from Eastern Michigan that got drafted, I think in the second round, Jason Jones. He went to Tennessee, played in Detroit for a couple of years, Seattle, I think, a couple of years. And Jason and I used to, you know, beat each other's ass in practice all the time. So he kind of got a taste of what NFL talent looked like. Uh Mike called me and was like, or I'm sorry, my old line coach, Simo, called me and was like, hey, you know, Mike gave me a call and might be a little interest in you, you know. So you start hearing a little bit of the buzz from the agent perspective of guys that, you know, might want to look at you. Um, so that was probably the beginning of it. And for me, it was kind of a surprise. I was like, oh, cool. You know, that's awesome. Like, I didn't I didn't know that going into my senior year. I thought my senior year was might have been the last time I played football, you know. Um, started getting a little buzz there and then the excitement starts to come along, you know, a little bit of more pressure, you know, you got to go out there and perform. And, um, you know, after that, I, I remember all I wanted to do was get a chance to go play in one of the uh, college, um, all-star games, you know, at that point, I think they, obviously the senior bowl, but they had like the East West shrine game. And then they had a newer one, might've been their second or third year. It was the Texas versus nation bowl which I don't know if any of you have ever even heard about that. Um, so I got an offer from them to go play. And I remember looking at the roster and I'm like, okay, there's some good talent, man. We got some Michigan, Ohio State, Alabama, you know, like there's some, there's some pretty good talent going to this game. I got to go play in it. You know, I got to go prove I can play against these dudes, you know, and I went down there and had a pretty good week. Um, that was awesome, you know, to have that experience down in El Paso, which, uh, not my favorite place to visit. <laughs> um, but there, it was funny during that same week, I had gotten a couple calls about the combine because that was my big thing. I'm like, if I can go to the combine, like I'm going to surprise a lot of people. You know, I had been clocked a couple times running, you know, four nine forties. That was 30 on the bench press, like my short shuttles, all that. I was just a really good athlete. And I'm like, if I can go to the combine and show all these teams, you know, that'll be huge for me. Um, and I got a call. Actually, I was down at the Texas First Nation game, and the guy called me. He's like, he came up like one vote short. And I was so pissed off, man, because I'm like, damn, if I could have went to the – and even looking at my pro day numbers from a couple weeks later, I would have been top three in every category for offensive linemen, except vertical jump. I can't jump for shit. But every other category, I would have been in the top three. And I was so pissed because I'm like, man, I just wish every team got a chance to see that, you know. Um, but then you start, like my agent started telling me, he's like, there's, you're kind of a sleeper guy. Like not a lot of people know about, you know, do their homework on Mac kids or Eastern Mich Central Mich, whatever it is. So the way the combine works, I think, is people vote on it, like, you know, from teams. Like, I don't know if it's executives or scouts, but they kind of vote on who they want to see. And he was like, there's probably some teams that didn't vote for you because they don't want everybody else to see it, you know? And I don't know if Green Bay was one of those teams or not, uh, but I was just so pissed, man. Um, anyways, you know, going into that kind of couple-month period there after the combine, I had to go on like 12 visits to other teams, and I just remember being so worn out. Like you're on a flight to Minnesota, then the next day straight from Minnesota to Chicago, then straight from Chicago to Green Bay, then straight to Baltimore, then Jacksonville, then San Diego. You know what I mean? It was just like, oh, my God, what the fuck? But I'll never forget, I left 
when I left those, when all those trips were done, I swear to God, I called my agent and I called my mom and I'm like, I hope the Packers draft me. Like I just, I hope the Packers draft me. That was the one place where I just kind of, after the visit, talking with the coaches, being around, it was like, this is the place I want to be, you know? And, uh, my God, I'm glad it worked out because obviously, uh, that was a great experience. So, um, I was one of those, I was never even coming out of high school, you know, Eastern Michigan offered me my, that was my one scholarship. I had to go play college football, you know? So even coming out of college was no different. I mean, I basically had, you know, no interest up until maybe the last second and, Hey, let's see what this guy's got. So, um, it was always, uh, obviously great that Green Bay drafted me because that was the place I wanted to go. And I'm glad they did. Thanks, TJ, Love for it. sharing. Uh, one last follow up on that. What What were you doing on draft? Uh, not on draft day. Well, obviously, you're taking in the fourth round. But what was that moment like, if you have a moment to describe it? Yeah. So I think, God, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think back then, Ty, you probably know this. Didn't they do the first three rounds on Saturday? It was I like round so. one through three. Oh, nine was, was like, yeah, I think oh nine was the last year that they did that. Yeah, right? okay, so it was rounds one through three were Saturday, and then four through seven on Sunday. Um, yeah. So, yep. like the days leading up to that, my agent had kind of told me mid round, right? Um, he called me maybe a couple days before the draft, you know, maybe on a Thursday, and was like, "Hey, there's a couple teams that." might look at you, you know, in the third round. And I was like, okay, well, that changes plans because we had a plan to have a get-together on Sunday. Um, so we had – it was actually a place, you know, close to Detroit. My dad always used to go just like the Elks Club. Uh, we had a bunch of family and friends. And, you know, Saturday we were up there, you know, partying and having a good time. I, I didn't feel like I was going to get drafted Saturday. Um, but then everybody came back again Sunday, and I think the draft started at like 11 o'clock in the morning, maybe 10 o'clock in the morning on Sunday. I think it was 11. Um, and I was the ninth pick of the fourth round, so I got drafted at like 11.30 on Sunday morning. <laughs> um, but at that point, you know, I had all my family, I had all my bunch of college buddies, you know. We had a great time sitting up at the top of the Elks Club in Ferndale, Michigan, and I remember getting a call and I'm looking at it. I'm like, you know, nine two zero. I'm like, that's not familiar, you know. And that whole call was awesome. I had to go like got on the rooftop so I could hear him <laughs> and uh, you know, talk to like Ted, talk to Mike, talk to I think Campy, who was the old line coach. And by the time I came back inside, you know, it was maybe thirty seconds later that it popped up on the screen that I'd been drafted. So that was a hell of a day, man. Getting drafted at eleven thirty in the morning and uh, uh, drinking and partying. I mean, that was a that was an epic Sunday. I'll tell you that. <laughs> so that's the perfect time to get drafted if you want to celebrate. Oh, You've got the whole man. day, all day drinking. Eleven thirty in the morning. It was awesome, man. Thanks, TJ. Appreciate it. Yeah, no problem, man. Hey, TJ, you've been unbelievable. I've, if we can sneak Joe in here before we uh, cut you loose, that'd be awesome. What's up, hey. Joe? Hey, TJ, how you doing, sir? Oh, you look like you've been sleeping half the Zoom there, buddy. You all right? Yeah, you good? <laughs> yeah. yeah. I've, been, I've been working while uh, listening to your podcast, and I don't sleep well too. So, but yes, uh, there you I'm go. in here. Uh, qu- I'm I'm a question about going from Green Bay to Detroit. You always hear like a narrative about how culture matters a lot in football. And you're going from you went from Green Bay to Detroit, where like Green Bay, you know they they won so many playoff games, et cetera. And you go to Detroit, Detroit's like they're kind of like a like at the time here and there they're kind of like the Siberia of like going to the playoffs. Did you ever notice there being like a difference in culture between those places, or was it just like hey, Green Bay always had great play? Like if you have great players, you can make whatever culture you want, whether you're the party. Si- party team or the hardworking team or whatever team like did you ever notice there were differences in that like in terms of like I, and i'm making this this is like a hyperbole like you know people they when they lost in green bay they it was really like the end of the world where if you went to a, a locker room where there wasn't like this winning tradition it wasn't as big of a deal so it's a long-winded question i just want to know if you found there to be differences yeah before. um I would say, I mean, losing is always a big deal. I don't think that matters where you're at. Uh, losing always sucks. But 
I will say um, expectations vary. You know, I think the standards vary from team to team. Um, you know, the bar is in Green Bay has always been set very, very, very high. It's basically Super Bowl or season's not good, you know. And um, I understood that coming into uh, Green Bay as a young player. Like, that was the bar. Like, it's not we want to win 10 games or we want to win the division or we want to make the playoffs. It's we want to win the Super Bowl. Anything less than that is unacceptable. And I think most teams will say that. You know, obviously, you know, when teams get together in April, like 32 of the teams will tell you the goal is the Super Bowl. You know, realistically, there's probably four or five that can really genuinely believe that. There's probably four or five that absolutely have zero chance. And then there's everybody else kind of in the middle, right? The other 20 are kind of right in the middle. You don't know. Um, but going to Detroit was just, yeah, it was it was different in a sense that in Green Bay, my eight years there, we'd made the playoffs every single year, right? Obviously won the Super Bowl, made it to three other NFC Championship games. Um, so that was the expectation. That was the expectation. Get to the, you know, win the division, get to the Super Bowl. Like, that was it. It was very clear cut, well-defined. Uh, going to Detroit, however, was more of we got to get to the playoffs, right? This is a team that hadn't won a playoff game, I think, since ninety. Two, right? So that was that was just the difference as far as you. We, I think we all knew in Detroit, you know, if we had a couple good years and we built the team, like yeah, we could have been a Super Bowl team. I think first we were nine and seven, barely missed the playoffs, and you never know what could happen in the playoffs. But that was the kind of difference. Just mentality from a player was okay. Do you want to win the Super Bowl every freaking year? Right. Just when you get in there, it's like people around this town will go fucking nuts. You know, like everybody will love you, right? Whereas in Green Bay, you get to a playoffs, you win a playoff game, but then you lose in a divisional round. It's like, oh, this team underachieved, right? So there's, there's, yeah, there's definitely slight differences. Um, I think as far as the mentality goes and just expectations. Um, not saying that's right or wrong, but just I've always always been a guy that just try to look at things realistically. You know, we're not going to win the Super Bowl this year, but can we make some freaking noise and win a playoff game? Maybe be a little surprise team. Like hell yeah, we can. Right. So I think that's a little bit of a difference. You know, just team to team, and I think it's realistic too. I mean, if you're a young player and you go into Houston this year and D'Amico Ryan is telling you we got to win the Super Bowl or we suck like are you I, I'm not trying to be a dick but if you guys were rookies going in would you believe that you, you were going to win a Super Bowl next year probably not right like I'm just saying you realize you got some hurdles you got to clear you got some areas that you got to get better and add some pieces and do this to um you know, and then you got teams, obviously, you go into KC or Buffalo or Cincinnati or Philly as a young player, and you're like, oh, shit, yeah, it's like, I got to pick my game up. These are the expectations. They were just in the Super Bowl. They were a powerhouse. They were a juggernaut. Like, I got to I gotta try to find my way to fit in here. So, I think that definitely varies uh, team to team. And you guys as fans, you guys know that. You know, you look at teams and say they got absolutely no chance. They got You look at teams and say, yeah, man, they, you know, they got a legit chance. It's no different being a player. You can't turn that off as – as much as uh, your coaches try to tell you, you know, this is a Super Bowl team, you kind of look around, you're like, eh. <laughs> oh, maybe if other, every other team, you know, has a ton of injuries, maybe. But, you know, it's, a, it's no different from players and fans. I think everybody, you kind of under, you understand what's going on, you know. Yeah, you look at that coach and you say, "Were you at Kittner's last night with me?" Having yeah, too many you're, you're drinking all that the pitcher of uh, that deadly mix that you pour at the end of the night. Whatever. The it's been crazy though here in Buffalo to see it change. I mean, I came back after that 2014 season, so I came back for Rex's first year in 2015. But there was this inferiority complex of like, man, people in Buffalo. I'm sure the Bills fans on here can attest to it. We've got some of the biggest Bills fans: Ryan, Mike, Joe. I mean. Megan, Clint, it's like it, it, Tyrod Taylor runs for, you know, a first down in a preseason game and people are going nuts. And 
you know, an eight win, nine win season gets everybody all jacked up where I can remember the in Green Bay, some of those playoff losses, you go to Starbucks the next morning and everybody's depressed. I mean, you go to oh, yeah. right downtown, yeah. go, any coffee, like everybody is just, it, it, it just, the whole town, the whole city is just dreary and down. And now Buffalo is getting to that place where knocking on the Super Bowl door for four years, not busting through. I think the fan expectation is at a Green Bay level now. People are people are pissed. You heard Mike earlier, like fourth and one. Let's yeah. go for it. I'm I'm tired of this. Probably should be. Yeah, and I'll tell you what, man. Just uh, you know, last Saints, I like Green Bay was so unique because it's football 365. You know, like coming here to Detroit, it's like well, we got the Red Wings, Pistons, you know, Tigers, and even you know most major cities. You have other sports. Even Buffalo, I know, it's small, but. You got a hockey team, you know, you got the Sabres, <laughs> but yeah. you know, in Green Bay, it's just, you feel that, you feel that constant, not pressure, but like just intrigue and interest, like every single day of the year, you know what I mean? And the expectation there is that's all we have. We need it to succeed, you know, like we have to have it. And I think as players, you feel that too. Uh, not saying, you know, playing anywhere else with the other bigger teams, you don't want to have that same success. But I think just from an expectation and a fan standpoint is, you know, as long as one of our four teams do this, like, we'll be all right. Well, Green Bay, it's like, that's all we have. It's one of one, right? So right. if they don't do it, you know, shit, we got to wait a whole nother year to do it again, you know? The so Bucks weren't was, shit uh, back then, right? They were nothing. Right, they were yeah. the worst team in the league. Yeah, and even in Green Bay, I mean, you don't really feel – like it's a split town of basketball no. fans. It's all football. You know, it's all it is. It's all football. And I think as players, you uh, you definitely understand that very early on. Well, TJ, you were phenomenal, man. We cannot thank you enough for uh, for hanging out like this, man. The, sharing all these stories, the good and the bad, Super Bowl triumphs and Seattle playoff games that slipped away we we didn't even touch on the lions crew Ooh. so that's our excuse to bring it back at some point yeah well, there wasn't much there anyway so. <laughs> <laughs> i appreciate your time hey all you guys man i appreciate talking to you thanks for the questions it's always good to uh remember the good times and reminisce a bit I have a couple silver bullets and uh talk some ball man it's always a good time ty thanks for having me brother hey no thank you tj you're, you're the man appreciate you taking all this time Hope to see you All soon. All right, fellas. I'll talk Thank to you. you. Later, Take care, boys. Man.